So I'm, I'm Amy Brand, um, a member of the Coolidge Board, uh, executive producer of the film. I had never seen it on the big screen, um, so it was really, really wonderful experience. And thank you all for being here. Um, and, you know, I've just actually seen that scene in um, the Ameri American Academy of Arts and Sciences where we brought all the women together, it just brought me back. And it's, it's just so great to be here. Um, so, you know, when we set out to make this film, it was sort of a coincidence that it was the timing of the Me Too movement that was not really the impetus for the story. Yeah, sorry, I'll hold this closer. Um, and when we were um, talking about doing this panel, we realized like, wow, you know, there's this real backlash against women's rights and bodily autonomy, uh, most resoundingly with the reversal of Roe v. Wade. Um, and, and also really, um, you know, we're seeing how the pandemic is reversed some progress for women in the workplace. So there are a whole host of issues, women in science, yes, but that, that go beyond that. So I think we can have a really rich discussion. I'm not one to sort of, you know, stand on ceremony. I want this to be relatively informal. We want the audience to participate as well. But I will start off with a few questions. And, um, and also because we have two Nancys, Nancy Hopkins, <laughs> Nancy Gertner, Sangeeta Bhatia as well, and you have their bios in your program and they were introduced earlier. I will, I will say Nancy H and Nancy G. Uh, to keep it clear, but I, I wanted to start off with you, um, Nancy Hopkins. Um, you know, I, I've been thinking about how, God, you put so much of yourself into this work, as you said. Um, there were some sacrifices in terms of um, your science. Things were kind of quiet for a while, and then we started up this project. It led to the film, it led to the book, and how has that impacted your life? Thank you for asking. <laughs> I should say, right, uh, this really was all you're doing, you're doing Amy. Uh, it was Amy's idea to make a movie about um, the story of MIT, what had happened at MIT and the MIT report. I think was, you're thinking 20 years on uh, after um, to do it. And I was totally unenthusiastic about doing this, actually. Um, <clears throat> partly because I had really never stopped working on it and I'd uh, been asked to give really a couple of thousand talks and I'd given a couple of hundred at least and uh, was ready to move on. I was retiring and I wanted to learn neuroscience. And um, anyway, but um, the reason that I agreed to do it was that um, working with the people at MIT, the women faculty at MIT was really one of the great experiences that I ever obviously had in my life. And she was going to get them all together again. So we we're going to have this reunion and spend time together. And um, it really was for that reason I wanted to do it. I must say, I agree with you, seeing it on the big screen I was shock. I'm sort of coming out of a shock, state of shock here. I never saw it because the film uh, was released during COVID. And so I never went to an event. So I was watching on a little screen, you know, thing. So suddenly, <laughs> my goodness gracious. Oh, boy. Anyway, but. Um, uh, there's a number of things I say. First of all, I wish all these women that I had worked with could be here because really it was something that couldn't possibly have happened without that solidarity. And they're still my dearest and most beloved friends. And um, this was uh, focused on the MIT report, which came from the School of Science. But MIT has science, engineering, and of course, it's really an engineering school. And at the same time, uh, in the movie, you also saw um, one of my colleagues from the School of Engineering. And she was doing in the School of Engineering what we were doing in the School of Science. And um, it, without that, uh, it, it would also not have worked. I mean, it took so many people coming together and supporting each other in this way. And then to have had these administrators in the School of Science, we had a dean, Bob Bergeno, who's not really shown in the movie, but he was essential. And then Bob Brown, as you saw at the end, who was the provost who with Chuck Vest really set about to change MIT. So um, I'm feeling overwhelmed here, but very grateful to Amy for having the proposal. I didn't get it, <laughs> but you did, and I think it was a really wonderful thing to make the movie, so thank you. Well, thank you. Um, so, uh, and, and now a, a question for Nancy Gertner. So much of what we, you know, we learn about gender bias you know, in the film seems to be specific to the sciences. And the president of Wellesley talked a bit about why you know, career progression in science is so difficult. And 
But um, as someone who has worked in the law and also focused on issues of bias, can you talk about what you see as the difference, differences and similarities between uh, experiences in the law? I have about five pages of notes. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I think one thing is uh, that what uh, Paul Johnson said in the movie is exactly right, which is the structure of science, like the structure of any employment that depends upon a single mentor that is not really collaborative. Uh, so it could be uh, a, uh, the head of a lab who is on whom the women in the lab completely depend for their, you know, for their future. It could be a doctor at MGH who runs an operating room and is king of the mountain. It could be a law firm partner who likewise, on whom the woman working with him depends for her advancement. So the issue is that there are men in these sort of non-collaborative, very powerful position on whom the women depend. And then you have, I mean, it's like the Lord of the Manor syndrome, where they can deal with the women with impunity because they have the stature to do it. In the NAS report, the National Academy report, they make it clear that sexual harassment, sexual assault, is really hand in glove with sex discrimination. It's both the reason why women don't continue in the field and it's also the reason why it happens because the men are still in positions uh, of power. You don't see that as much in more collaborative environments where your future can depend on multiple peoples, but you surely see it and you see it in law, as I said. The most, my, my reaction, I also had never seen it on the big screen. My reaction is how wonderful things have changed and how much they have stayed the same. Um, since I have left the bench, I didn't anticipate doing this. Uh, I've gotten, I've represented women in numbers of situations like this, women at high status hospitals uh, who woke up one morning with the head of the operating room, the doctor who was in charge in her bed. She got, he got her drunk and that was that or women at the head of major institutions who likewise wind up with uh, uh, investigations uh, triggered by the person that is above them in the pecking order. And dare I say it, uh, women at MIT, I represent the fabulous Kristen Knauss, who's in the audience, uh, who has a sex discrimination case, not unlike the ones that are talked about in this film. And that's today. Um, Sangeeta, I wanted to ask you about, um, well, I'll, I'll say that when we started working on the film, I approached a number of women of younger generations at MIT to ask if they wanted to participate. We had, we'd initially conceived of the film as being focused on MIT and different generations going up through, you know, career progression. And the vast majority said, you know, I relate to this, I've experienced this, but I in no way want to be associated with it. Um, I don't want to be known for anything other than my science. You know, I don't want to be seen as a whiner. That was a, a word that was used. Um, and yet, you know, you stepped forward, you've participated, you've been outspoken, this has been your work. Um, can you talk about that reaction and, and, and how you feel about that? So. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for kicking off this whole project and it led to the exceptions and I'm just like totally fangirling over these two, like <laughs> the legendary Nancys, like so <laughs> amazing to be on stage. <laughs> 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 um, but, but you know, I think that, um, I think what Nancy G, what you just said is so right, which is that um, there's this conflict, right? We can both be really happy with the progress, and I feel so privileged to do the work that I do, the science that I do. We have, you know, four of the department heads in the School of Engineering are women right now. We have two, you know, amazing women president, university presidents in town, so much progress. I really love my job, and I'm incredibly frustrated at the same time, at the pace, and that we're still having this conversation. And I will say that, um, my husband and I, we have two daughters. My older daughter is a geology major. <laughs> and right now, she's on her first field trip. And I, this film, I have to tell you, landed completely differently on me today. <laughs> the first time I saw it. 
So, you know, we, we have to have these conversations. I think it's part of paying forward the privilege to be here to change the profession. You talked about that in the film, that we can, if we're in it, um, we can change it. And we can, our labs will have different cultures. You know, that I've been working on diversifying biotech, which is another ecosystem where women have been left out. And, you know, if we build those companies and our vision of what the industry can be, then, then we can change them. So. I think we have to hold both ideas at the same time. Yeah. Hey, hey, I want to say something, because something that does concern me, and I'd love to hear what the audience thinks about this, because um, this, the things that took place at MIT, it's a long time ago, you know, and there really has been enormous change. And my concern is, will this discourage people who see this? because um, it really is so much better. And actually, you know, I have to always have data with me, so I brought some data. <laughs> I, I just want you to know that uh, right here we have the president, the provost, the chancellor, and the uh, vice president for research at MIT, and they are all women today. <laughs> we have the dean of science is a woman, the first one in the history of MIT. And here, as Sangeeta mentioned, are uh, the chairs of the Department of Engineering at MIT, the eight departments. And there are five women and, a f uh, yes, yeah, right. I think that's right, and three men. <laughs> and we have- I was out of date. <laughs> uh, two, there are two of these women are black. Uh, a number of these people are immigrants. Um, it, it, it's really ex it's unbelievable. And so there really has been change, and I think it's really important to, to note that. I have to say, though, again, looking at this, I think that um, uh, other areas, you know, despite all of that, the percent of women on the science and engineering faculty at MIT is about 21%. So still a big diff gap. And so you have this tremendous progress at the top while still having the numbers below. And we're hiring at the rate that the uh, applicant pools, absolutely at, uh, at or above the applicant pools. So it's a slow process. Law is the same way. The, 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 the pipeline is wider. There are 50% of the classes at all law schools are women. But as you go up the ladder in big firms, there are fewer and fewer women. And judges, there are now more and more judges, actually, thank to President Biden, but um, women judges, rather. But it, is a, it, it should have not taken this long because it has been 50% women in the graduating class for almost 30 years. And so this says something about the, uh, how embedded these issues are. Exactly, thank you for sharing that data. And um, I'm just, I'm gonna go off script here. I'd, I'd love to hear more, Sangeeta, about your experiences in the biotech space and the work you're doing. Yes, thanks for asking about that. So, um, so well, Nancy actually was a hero of mine. Um, and, uh, Which Nancy was that? <laughs> <laughs> both, oh, actually both. Yeah. Both. Just saying. <laughs> but in, the, in, this, in this story, Nancy Hopkins was the hero of this particular issue, which is that she, she got a Lifetime Achievement Award a few years ago. Um, and, and she well deserved. Uh, and I, I introduced her, and um, being characteristically a rabble rouser, she accepted the award. It was a biotech conference. She looked out at the crowd and said, this industry looks like MIT did 40 years ago. <laughs> and um, I was sitting at a table with Susan Hockfield, who's a former president of MIT, and we sort of decided, the three of us, to do something about it. Um, so we formed a working group called the Boston Biotech Working Group. It was at the American Academy that we started the work, um, had a series of dinners, stakeholders around town, um, and eventually um, it turned into something called the Future Founder Initiative at MIT. And um, we took a playbook from, from the MIT 16 Women, um, which is to think about how do we affect change. So Nancy had created a formula, both Nancy's. <laughs> um, and the formula was you need data, you need stories because people can't really hear the data alone without the stories. And then you need champions and you need leaders. Um, and so that's really been um, the playbook that we're trying to, to follow for um, increasing the number of women in biotech. Uh, the data are that under 9% of MIT startups in the life sciences are started by women. 
in the last 15 years. Um, in some departments, which I will not name, but you can guess, there are 54 companies that come out in the last 15 years, 52 by men, two, two by women. Um, so really stark differences. Um, and largely women have been just left out of an ecosystem, mostly through unconscious bias, not really having a conversation, not being invited to the party, not on the scientific advisory boards, et cetera. Um, not able to raise venture capital. 2% of venture capital goes to women-founded companies in the US. So on and on. So we're having, we had the data. Now we have some stories, and I'm happy to go over those later. Um, and now we're trying to, um, we have some amazing leaders at MIT who are getting behind us. Susan was one of them, but the Dean of Engineering has been an incredible supporter. Um, and we're trying to put pro programs in place to kind of hack the system and go faster so it won't take 40 years um, to increase those numbers. Last year, we had nine women faculty participate in our first future founder faculty program, and eight of them are now starting companies. So we're not there yet, but we're getting there. Um, I have a long list of questions, but this is always so much more fun when it's interactive, and I'd love to hear from members of the audience if you have questions. I'll start with Manolas, because I know your name. Go ahead. Uh, should I run the microphone or just speak loud? Um, you know what? I'll, I'll come down and do the microphone thing, because I don't, yeah. I can, okay. I can I, I can be loud enough, but maybe not everyone. So, so first of all, congratulations. This was extremely moving, extremely emotional. I'm here with my two daughters and my son, so I want them to have a just uh, future. And uh, it's, it's very, very inspiring. So thank you to both of you guys. Uh, I've been Amy for spearheading this and, and the, four, the, the four of you here. And also just everybody involved in the movie. This is fantastic. Um, seeing also the champions, seeing Bob Brown basically overturning the report, I think, is a ray of hope. Um, so I, I have two questions. The first of them, uh, the first is, has that been changed at MIT? Do we now have data that actually shows that we're closer to sort of that percentage? And then the second one is, many people will justify that by saying, oh, you have fewer grants, and therefore you're going to have less space. But then you're fighting bias all the way through you know, on the grant side, on the funding side, on the paper side, you have, you know, fewer grants because you have fewer senior author papers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, the space is very measurable and all the other things are not as measurable. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you could sort of share some of the data-driven work that you or others have done to basically get at that sort of long list of contributing factors that you could use to sort of justify uh, these inequalities? Well, uh, when we did the space analysis, of course, we also collected the data on how much money people raised, because you have you know, to make sure that they were raising the amount of money that they could. And, um, and the answer was, yes, they were. Um, so you have to, just numbers alone, and that kind of analysis. Also, because the number of women involved was so small, as you know, not enough to be statistically significant no matter what you do, okay? So you have to do the study in a way where you collect the experiences of the people. The other thing that was critical was sitting on the committees and looking at the data of people who spent their whole life in the profession. So they were, in fact, when we were founding, starting that up and have a committee, I didn't want any men on the committee because I didn't think they were any capable of understanding the problem at MIT <laughs> <laughs> at that time. Now there are a lot, but at that time. so. And the dean, Bob Bergner, said, oh, you have to have men on the committee. And I said, okay. And he said, because otherwise, no one's <laughs> going to believe you, I guess, is what he was thinking. <laughs> and he was absolutely correct, of course. So we had these people on the committee who had been department chairs. One of them had a Nobel Prize, of course. One of them, uh, two of them, they'd all been department chairs, I guess. And so when the women came in and told their stories, some of them come in and say, well, this happened to me. So then we say, okay, we'll go get the data to see if it's true, make sure it's correct. We'd collect all the data, but the, from the story alone, they knew this does not ha this is not supposed to happen this way. So it really takes that kind of analysis. And then the question after this happened, and there was a committee set up in all the schools, and, and and one of my closest friends, Lana Gibson, is here tonight. She ran the engineering school. She's really responsible, in my opinion, for this incredible picture here. Um, she changed the school of engineering at MIT. Um, and um, so. 
we, for, for a number of years, data was collected to, to keep confirming. And these gender equity committees, they got reinvented. They went away for a while, they came back again because people could see it was slipping. And once again, so the, it, it opened the door to having access to a mechanism that you could reactivate it as you needed. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, this question is, uh, when people advance who have traditionally not been included, people always think, oh, they must have gotten there by some unfair means, they're not as good. And that underlies the whole thing, right? The whole problem, that I believe, was the reason they're not advancing is because we believe so strongly in this meritocracy that we can't, that's what makes it so hard, both for people to believe it and for people to tell the stories. If you tell the story, it must be you're not good enough. If you were, you wouldn't have having the problem. And even if you were having the problem, you're such a genius, you should be able to overcome it no matter what. Well, that just isn't correct, <laughs> okay? And that's the hard one that I think we're having. And I think that um, one of the things I guess I found somewhat discouraging, I thought when we did it, you know, for women, women were women, but it turns out now we have all these different gradations as we learned in the movie. When you come to um, the women who are black women, they have this double bind. So they have a whole new set of problems. And now you need people with real knowledge of what it's like in, uh, so when we set up this diversity council that was going to deal with this for all of MIT, they were going to call it diversity. I said, well, you have to do minorities. You can't just do women and call it diversity. So we had that. So I thought, now we understand a problem for these women who happen to all be white. There you know, were so few there, and they were white. Um, we met, and the African-American black faculty, Hispanic faculty came to the diversity council. There were about 15 of us on us, 20. The president came, the provost the deans of science and engineering and, and black faculty and women faculty. And I was shell-shocked by the stories that the black faculty told. I couldn't believe it actually could have happened. Um, things like, you know, not being able to rent an apartment in Boston. Things like, you know, having to worry about what you wear on campus so you won't be arrested. <laughs> I just couldn't even believe it was possible. Now, this was early 2000s, but um, so you realize how hard, even when you understand the problem, to understand it for a group of people whose experience is different is still very, very hard. So that was very eye-opening. And I think um, the story here with Rachel, I think Rachel and Jane, by the way, are absolute heroes. They were doing this alone, wow. And um, but Rachel, I think there, she's, what she's talking about, that's the way MIT was when I started. And there really has been progress. You know, this thing of being considered to be the janitor because you're black, or we, we, yeah. you know, this kind of stuff. So, <laughs> there is work to do, but. Yeah, let's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw some other hands, yeah. I think it's a mark of the success of this movie that at the end of it I felt like killing some people. Um, so uh, th that aside, uh, I'm a doctor and we have uh, obviously uh, the same problem if not more so in medicine, but I have one note of hope. In psychiatry, it's moving. And at this point, at the hospital I teach at, more than half of the residents, actually close to three quarters of the residents are women. And so, uh, you know, somehow it's a little bit different from things like surgery, but I think that's an, a, a very positive step. Wanted to make sure we didn't hear only downer news. I, can I, I just want to uh, follow along with this. So how can it be that we are both hopeful and worried at the same time? And I think the, the answer is there certainly have been changes. There is um, what it takes to change is part of what this movie is about, which is it takes allies, it takes, uh, to some degree, women of stature, women of accomplishment who can be secure in their accomplishment, otherwise the, the legal process can grind you down. And there is a backlash. There is a substantial backlash to the Me Too movement going on now. Um, uh, when we tell stories of sexual harassment, we wind up with not just being, you know, you're being a whiner, or isn't the punishment disproportionate? It's amazing that Marshawn was not, people were not wringing their hands that the punishment was disproportionate to what he did. There is a very substantial uh, backlash. Woke, uh, you know, that discussion is, uh, you know, keep your head down again. So I think, I mean, I think that the message, the takeaway is the, the, the need for institutional supports to not give up. I think that this is, you're talking about, you know, generations of discrimination and generations of attitudes that are embedded, and it, it's, it takes 
we were talking about this at dinner, it takes a village. It takes a village to bring one of these cases, it takes a village to sustain this kind of work. And that's why these movies are so important. Thank you. You can either speak very loudly or I can... Etc. Okay, I have a question for Nancy G about Title IX regulations. Um, so we have these channels to complain, um, and there have been changes, and I think women are being heard. Um, yet, it's still, in my experience, a very cumbersome process. I feel like the whole burden is on women to report. There's very little support. You might have to engage a lawyer. There's no financial support. There is there are many, many loopholes. If, if someone moves between institutions, there's no way for Title IX offices to communicate. Um, what do you think needs to change and where do there need to be changes made? Is it at the federal level? What do the current laws basically require universities to do? You know, how can we actually make the system so that it encourages people, people to speak up and you know, for things to actually happen? I, I think additional legal change is necessary, but let, but let me sort of talk about the political change for a moment, because um, numbers of women will not bring Title IX cases, women of stature, women of high status or in high status professions. And what I heard from many of the women that I represent is, I don't want to be Googled and have this come up first. Um, and so in a, in a social media world, that's a problem, that is an issue. How do you begin to get a narrative out that others will uh, support? And, and then, you know, uh, part of the backlash, which has to be, I think, uh, the subject of, of legislation, part of the backlash is men of stature with resources can fight back in a way today that they never did before. I mean, when I started practicing nine million years ago, um, you, you, you would write a demand letter, and I used to love my demand letters. They, we called them oh shit letters. It would be, dear institution, we have discovered that you are discriminating against the following 10 people, I have the following evidence, and then it would sign my name, and they would, you'd have the idea that they would open up and go, oh shit. Now, People are steeled for that. Institutions are steeled for that. There are legions of lawyers that are on the defense side. There are defamation suits that men who have been accused are bringing. Um, uh, I think the law has to change to make that impossible to bring a defamation suit in the middle of an investigation before an investigation is concluded. We have to figure out a way of getting resources to women so that they can defend against this. Um, but there's, I mean, as I thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, some of it can be fixed by law, but if the reversal of Roe v. Wade is any example, some of it has to be reversed by a mobilization and politics. And the mobilization and politics can't stop uh, until, we, until the, the, the portrait of MIT is the, a portrait of positions of power across the country. That's the problem because that's the, it's the disjunction of power that is the problem here. So I can't, I can't come up with a legislative solution. I have some ideas, but it really is a mobilization and it's a mobilization that can't stop uh, until we've achieved this. And if anyone wants an oh shit letter, I have a form. I really enjoyed this movie. It was great. And um, I, I guess this question may be a little bit out of bounds, but I'll just run it by you anyway. Um, I, I remember when Dr. Marchand left BU, and some, I don't think that there was outrage about it, but I think, I mean, I remember I read the Science Magazine article. And, um, you know, I, I guess I thought it was a shame that all his research was lost and that it was just, you know, it just disappeared, that he was probably doing great work and there were also a lot of people that defended him, which may be why the professors said he could come back after three years or whatever it was. But um, this movie allowed me to see 
and hear the voice of um, Jane. I didn't understand why she waited so long, and now I understand. <laughs> and also the second case that came up, I mean, I think it was summarized, but that was just really awful, um, the geologist. So that was a terrible, terrible situation. But um, you, you kind of illustrated how a lot of people, how sexism can happen just because of b bias that we all absorb, and that that can almost just be corrected by raising awareness. And people, people I, I loved that you interviewed the guy who went to Antarctica with um, Jane, don't remember who didn't something. notice, who hadn't noticed. Yeah. I it, mean, that's extraordinary. It was great to hear him, and, and, but he didn't realize that this was happening, right? And, um, but if you have somebody who, so, so, so the case of Dr. Marchand may be extreme, you know, maybe that, I mean, there were people who argued that he was also a good guy when this all happened, but, you know, um, people m make mistakes and make really bad mistakes. So if this is going to be highlighted and things are going to change, which would be really great, is there a way to allow people who make bad mistakes to come back and do their research and do the science if they fix, if, you know, is there a way to fix it? You know, that, that's just the question. But I, this was terrific. Yeah. Do any of you wanna... I, I, I'm sorry, I, I will start, but I will not monopolize this. Um, or I will monopolize, no. <laughs> um, I think, first of all, something that you said at the beginning is interesting. It was said that Dr. Marchand's research was lost. But what was interesting about this film and is interesting about the society is consider the countless number of women scientists who could have been Marchands, whose work has been lost. And then the other issue is the forgiveness issue. Now, that's a very interesting issue. I think we've learned post Me Too that there is a continuum here. And at one end is you know, Harvey Weinstein, who deserves what he has gotten. Um, and then there's at the other end of the continuum, people may disagree with maybe Al Franken. And they didn't deserve the same kind of uh, punishment. But a serial harasser as to whom multiple women complain, uh, who is using not just uh, you know, bad language, but literally propositioning women and sleeping with women is in a very different category. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the uh, regret tour looks like for such a person, but that really is a different, ca maybe there is one, but before you get there, you have to restore the people that were hurt all along the way. Thank you. I was going to try to speak loud, but I got scared. <laughs> um, first off, I just want to thank all of you and everyone who is on in the movie for everything. I mean, as, as a young woman in science, I've only benefited from everything you all have done. So, yeah. I have, I have two young women next to me who have also benefited from you, and we're all here together just... It's insane to watch you guys discuss this and also relate to you in a way and, and share similar struggles, but we wouldn't be able to sit here and relate to that if you guys weren't here. So I, I can't even explain and thank you guys enough for being able to feel that and not feel alone. <laughs> I mean, it's easier to feel that and feel that with you than it could have been alone, so thank you. Um, but I kind of come from potentially a similar place of what you guys feel. Um, I, I am a neuroscientist. I, I work at Dana-Farber. Um, I come from a relatively privileged place of I am a white woman. Um, I have so many. I work in a field where most of the people I work with are actually lovely in, in the sense of I'm actually one of the only white people I work with, which is like my favorite part of what I do. Um, but there's so many people who are underprivileged that I want to be able to help. And I, I am actually in a position of privilege, thanks to you women. Um, and I just wanted to know if you guys had any advice for someone who is in my position who could help other people. I mean, I'm in a similar position that you guys were probably in, but there's people, there's other women, black women, Asian American women, other people who don't have the privilege that I have. And I just 
want to know if you guys had any advice on how to help those women. Maybe Sakita, do you want to <laughs> respond? Well, first of all, what a lovely question. It's great that you're asking that. I am I'm curious your both perspective, but I think that one thing we didn't talk a lot about is that this work can be really rewarding, but also really, really hard. Um, and I, th I think both of the Nancys have, like, have given a lot of their like, heart and soul to this work. Um, and so to get through it, it's, it's really important to find like, a collective um, uh, people to support you because there will be like great days that are rewarding and hard days and days of despair and days of optimism and it's, it's, it is really important to find people to like go with you on the journey um, of change so that would be advice number one and then the other thing is sometimes it feels like there's so much work to do it's overwhelming um, and my personal way of dealing with that is to sort of like pick the piece that's in front of me that I feel I can change, you know, given my position in this moment and just work on that. Um, and, you know, over your career, there may be different pieces or there may be a most important piece that you can get to, but don't put it on yourself to change all of it all at once. I think, can I say one thing? <clears throat> and it was a great question. And I think, um, I do really think there's something really changing. And I think what it is partly is that science itself is so important now to a society. You can't, it, it, it is where we are in, you know, science and engineering are driving so much of what's going on economically in the world. I think we've come to see that you cannot leave whole groups of people behind and have a society that functions and leave people out of science. You just can't do it. <laughs> and um, I have to say that, um, you know, I just recently met the new president of MIT and I find her to be absolutely inspirational. I think she's a person who understands this problem deeply and she came from Duke and she's had a very different experience and um, we talked about this you know it's just not okay and that's why I think you know what's going on here tonight is so important this requires a whole community it really does it uh, requires the university administration it requires people like you who are young people who see it and know that this isn't right we have to do something about it but I do think there's a real change. Uh, you know, we, used to, we really did used to picture uh, a single type of person as a scientist. Now we know you can't even function in this society if you're not at least some kind of scientist. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I, I'm really optimistic, actually. Yeah. I, I think it, it yeah. also takes a group. I mean, I can't downplay the, the importance of support. Um, I talk to my students, and uh, they were, what, the difference between growing up now and when I started is I had the same kind of experiences that, that Nancy talked about. I mean, people, the, the best one of all was someone who told me I would never make it as a lawyer. Applied for a big firm, for a job at a firm, and he told me I'd never make it as a lawyer. The only good thing is that when I was a judge, I have a list of all those people who said that. <laughs> right? But, but the, the, the difference today is that they don't say that to you. The problem is it's much more inchoate, it's much more coded, and what I worry about is my students walk away saying, well, then it was me. I didn't get that job because I wasn't good. And that's why it's critical that these stories be shared and that you work with other women because it can't be you are all not good. It, what the, you know, there, there's something on him. So the stories are important and the support with one another because Frankly, the kinds of behaviors that are shown in this film are rarely the aberrant behavior of a man, um, uh, or you know, it could be a man or a woman, but it's rarely aberrant. It's usually he said, she said, she said, she said, and she said. So you have to keep that in mind and you have to find your allies. Thank you so much. And on that note, um, we've run out of time for questions, but thank you all very much. Thanks to our fabulous panelists. Um, and to the Coolidge, so thank you.